Welcome, everyone. My guest today is lead analyst Logan Motoshami to talk about the CPI report and how the Fed will interpret that data. Logan, welcome back to the podcast on CPI Day. Good. It's wonderful to be here. Pretty interesting last few weeks we have had uh, uh, in the bond market, mortgage rates, labor, inflation discussion. Uh, it, it for, for like really geeky, nerdy people, this is kind of as uh, good as it gets. Yeah. So um, let's talk about you wrote an article after the inflation data and and let's just say it missed a little bit and people are, are confused about what that means, what the Fed's going to do, what we should be looking at. What was your take on the inflation data? So to me, um, as always, paper, rock, scissors, labor over inflation. So what has happened is that the 10-year yield, I think April 24th uh, or 25th, uh, the 10-year yield got to 4.73%. And then it's been heading lower. During this time, we've been getting kind of like hawkish statements from the Fed, and it wasn't like the PPI inflation data was low. That was uh, uh, overheated. But the 10-year yield kept on going lower and lower. Tis the night before a CPI report that I uh, tweeted out. And overnight trading, which is usually crazy to the upside, was slowly like getting lower. I was like, all was calm before CPI. And then the CPI report came out, just a little smidge uh, uh, miss of estimates, and the 10-year yield has gone lower. And then the Federal Reserve sent their media person out, and, and you know Nick Schmeres would talk about, oh, this is just one report. We're not going to... Bond yields went up a little bit and came back down. So uh, a little bit of confusion out there for a lot of people. But again, what data line has been getting softer in the last few weeks? Labor. Labor. Labor data has been getting softer for some time now, if you read the internals of the report. But then we finally had a headline jobs report that missed. Um, and again, for just for me, the labor data still beating my estimates. Even if I do post revisions, I was expecting about 140 to 165,000 jobs per month by now. We're still uh, above that on the six month average. But if labor is really the main reason, then does the 10-year yield make more sense uh, after inflation? So um, staying consistent with my t theme since 2022, labor over inflation, right? The growth rate of inflation was, oh, it's CPI was at, um, God, was it 9% in 2022? We had lower mortgage rates, right? So I think that's the confusing part is that people had lower bond yields and lower mortgage rates with hotter inflation. And now the growth rate of inflation has fallen. Like 3.4% inflation CPI headline is basically running on the average we've had since 1914, pretty much. So I think that's where the confusion, but if you just think about it, if the labor data gets softer or the economy gets weaker, then there's more room for the bond market to go lower. Um, and the labor data is not breaking. GDP is, well, I think we're still above 3% uh, uh, for uh, uh, Q2. So uh, if you just look at it in that light, maybe the last few weeks kind of can make sense. Uh, but I know a lot of people had thought, okay, we're just going to go straight to 5%, maybe 6%. The Fed's got a hike rates. And all of a sudden, the market dynamics have shifted. And just remember, we're still kind of in this uptrend on the 10-year yield from the lows of uh, earlier this year. But uh uh, labor over inflation. And hopefully, even with this inflation report, you could kind of see we made unbelievable progress on a 12 month uh, uh, average, but the 10 year yield is still high and we still have 7% uh, mortgage uh, uh, rates. Uh, but the economy matters. And this is why twice now, two times we've had the 10 year yield go lower. We've had the two year yield go lower, pricing in economic weakness and softness for it to just retrace back up. So this is one of these, we're in this kind of the big, huge fight between the Fed, the bond market, mortgage rates, labor data, inflation, everything that goes into the whole economic enchilada. And we just got to look at the data one week at a time and then kind of pick out the things that you know we can see where we see softness or where we see strength and we take it from there. But I, I, I got a sense that there was a lot of confusion. Uh, after the inflation report. Yeah, if you just look at social, so I follow a bunch of economists, right? And uh, one of them was saying that he really, despite the inflation report, he really feels like uh, all all rate cuts are off the table this year. So would love to get your take on that because it is the thing that we're all, you know, obviously the market can go around the Fed anyway. 
But when it comes to the Fed, do you think we still have rate cuts on the table? Right now, the two-year yield is is pricing in a rate cut. So uh, I know there's a lot of, uh, there's another Fed funds futures uh, pricing mechanism, but to me, the two-year yield has a rate cut. But again, it doesn't really matter what anybody thinks today. We were, we had what six rate cuts priced in at one point, you know, uh, and now it's gone to zero. So we're all over the place. This is a party, man. You're just everyone's everyone's drunk and trying to dance together. It's a, nobody makes any sense, and everyone everybody sobers up. And it was like, I don't want to dance with you. I don't want to, you know. So um, always follow the labor data. Follow jobless claims. Jobless claims did have a big spike. You know, some of that has to do with New York uh, school ending, but. Uh, if the labor data starts to get really weaker, it will override the Fed. Why? Because the Fed is not going to control the bond market. The bond market has shown us now twice that they they'll get ahead of the Fed. But uh, as of now, don't focus so much on what can happen six months from now. Follow the weekly data; it'll guide you there. And what's happened is every time yields have gone down, mortgage rates have gone down, the economic data firmed up, and yields have gone back up. So. Uh, uh, I would call it a crowded trade gone bad. That's kind of what I see with the bond market when they aggressively push down uh, uh, bond yields or the two-year yield, thinking that the economy is going into recession, the Fed has to cut. This is the whole banking crisis. Remember, the banking crisis happened, the two-year yield just collapsed, and everyone's like, oh, the Fed has to cut rates, You know, more bank failure. So there's, there's more of a recognition now that the longer we stay up here, the more the higher the risk of, an, of a recession at one point is. And I think the Fed is trying to now try to navigate that thread uh, as good as they can. But again, the 10-year yield will call this. We just need confirmation. And if the labor data gets softer from where we are, then that's the kind of the final confirmation. The other twos were just basically assumptions. But uh, the, that's why I would say that the labor data is the kind of nail in the coffin on that. And the spreads are getting better for mortgages, right? That's a huge story. Last year, biggest story. Nobody really wanted to talk. Spreads got worse. Biggest story right now, the spreads are getting better. So just keep it very simple. God, we we, we could be a half a percent higher in mortgage rates today uh, uh, if we took the peak uh, um, uh, levels of how bad the spreads were last year. So we're still 1% away from like being normal, you know, or, or 75 basis points away. But here, God, you know, the, there's some, there's some, Things in the back of the you know uh, uh, hill that you could see that are, are that are kind of positive just for lower rates. But again, we want this to happen without a job loss recession. That's the thing. We want you know we 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 can't be an industry rooting for really bad economic data. So housing gets disproportionately impacted in a positive way, right? We got disproportionately impacted in a negative way with a stronger economy. But on the other side, you get. Uh, disproportionately benefited. And we all see what happens when rates like head down towards 6%. The uh, uh, demand data starts to get better. Okay. So in your analogy of uh, it's like a party, it's late, everybody's drunk, dancing with each other, and then they're sobering up. Like in that analogy, Logan, you're the one in the corner, didn't take any drink, has looking at charts, and I want to go over and go, okay, what what should we do now? I can't trust any of these other people. That's why I ask you. You, you know, you know, you know what's funny, Sarah? That was me at that uh Texas event, right? Everyone was drinking, listening to music, and then I'm I'm sitting there looking at charts and I was like, oh, oh the 10-year eels this. Oh my god. Hey, hey, look at this chart. Look at this chart. Yeah. I'm a total nerd. I, I'm I'm telling you, that's just like I I I rarely drink. I don't go to parties. I don't go to clubs. I literally Saturday, Friday nights, I'm writing the tracker article. You know, I'm, I'm, that is me, but, but everyone else is normal, right? Everyone likes to have fun. And, you know, I'm just saying that, you know, if everyone's drinking too much and then I'll just sober up, you're like, oh my God, why am I dancing with you? Goodbye. You know, or what, what, what are, what are we doing? No, this is not working out. So the bond market crowded trade, you know, sometimes you could overdo it to the upside. Sometimes could overdo it on the downside. That's how markets are sometimes, Right. And uh, we kind of uh, uh, take it take it for, with that, with a grain of, grain of salt and realizing that efficient markets sometimes aren't that efficient in the short term. Over the long run, they, they tend to work themselves out. But uh, we've had two different episodes where I think the bond market was, that was all Gandalf line, right? Remember the whole Gandalf line last year? I was like, you know, I don't really think the 10-year yield should break below 3.37 unless the labor market's breaking. So I'm like, you shall not pass. And then they kept on testing. I'm like, my God, it's eight times we're testing this level. Are we really, 
you know, but it, it didn't, it held and retraced back up. So, so the last few weeks, I get it, man. It is confusing, right? You have hawkish feds. We are not going to cut rates and then the mortgage rates are going to lower. So just remember economic data, labor data, that's the one variable that we know in the last three weeks that has gotten soft. So kind of go with that. Okay. The, uh, some other topics I want to talk about. We always talk about inventory this last week. Uh, on the housing market tracker, we did see inventory get better than it had been the week before, but the week before was a very low bar of like 3,500 homes. And we're not, we missed your window of 11,000 to 17,000 homes. I get, I get all excited for two weeks, you know, and then all of a sudden, and now um, rates have uh, gone lower a little bit. So, well, again, th- it gets a little bit more interesting when, when, when rates go lower with duration on what the inventory channels, just to give you all a really good example, the end of 2022, um, the case for lower mortgage rates that we wrote on October 27th. And the reason why we we want to highlight that is we want to see how the data looks when rates go down. And what had happened was uh, from November of 2022, we had 12 straight weeks of kind of positive data line taking holidays out of it. And that made it harder for inventory to grow, right? Supply and demand equilibrium. So it took the longest time to find a seasonal bottom in 2020. Because remember, we're not working with much, right? We're not working with that much home. So uh, just a little push in demand curve can, can make it harder for inventory to grow. So 2023, God, home sales still trended out near all-time lows. Inventory didn't really grow. Home prices were growing. That you know, Affordability got worse. No real growth in sales. I mean, that, that's not a healthy market. This year, rates have stayed elevated for longer. So the growth of inventory... And I think those individuals that we're talking about a mortgage rate lockdown, that inventory can't grow, that, you know, nobody's going to sell their low mortgage rates ever. Everyone's going to be stuck in there. Like, honestly, if there was an actual theoretical mortgage rate lockdown, you know how bad that would be for housing? Like all those people selling their homes with low mortgage rates, they didn't do it for the last 19 months. It'd be terrible, right? Home sales would be a lot lower than what they are right now. But there are people every single week that are selling their mortgage rates because they qualify, you know, so they're, they're not, I think everybody, everybody like, like there's some really bad takes on housing and it almost assumes that everybody is a single renter and their, their total incomes are what they are at 26 and they never grow. They're never wages. There's no dual household income. So there are, there's a reason why we have near 5 million home sales. Not, not everyone is 26 years old and doesn't get any help from their parents and has a low paying job. So, uh, people sell their homes, sell their low mortgage rates. They're putting inventory to the market. The demand curve isn't very strong. We see that in the purchase application data. Uh, we're still back in the 1990s levels and it's just allowing inventory to grow. And this is like, oh, this is kind of what I wanted to happen last year, but it's happening this year. I was just on CNBC, you know, I was on CNBC in a lighthouse. You know, uh, uh, and I was like, oh, is this going to work? It's like four o'clock in the morning. I'm, I'm, you know, I've got the lighthouse red light that looks out to the ocean. Okay, I'm maybe thinking, you should oh, explain why this... you were in a lighthouse, because people are going to be like, why do you just hang no, out I was, I was in I was in Lincoln City, Oregon, you know, and then and the CNBC said, do you want to be, uh, do you want to come on Monday morning to talk about underwater mortgages? And I was like, okay, great. I was like, oh my God, I, I didn't bring my gel. I didn't bring the clothes. I, I didn't bring it. You know, I didn't bring anything. You know, so it was just like, okay, let's see if this works. Um, But what I explained to CNBC was like, you know, this is good because we have more choices. And when people have more choices, it's a positive. And and not every single thing has to be a 30, 40 percent home price crash. Like like we've always said, YouTube is crazy. Twitter is crazy. Those people are nuts. Right. I mean, uh, that, that my job is to explain why it's like you don't have to be so fragile. And think that you know every single second of your life, the whole the world is going to come to an end. So positive this year, very big positive that the growth rate of inventory. Now, now theoretically, you can say, oh, oh it's up thirty five percent. My personal thing, I do not like using percentages when you're working from the lowest levels ever. Remember the foreclosure guy, the foreclosure guy. We're going to go in the credit data next. Seven hundred percent foreclosures. You know, it's well, housing two thousand eight. It's going to go. It's like this small. You cannot get the job done. Homie, this small, you're not going to satisfy anyone. It's not going to work, right? That's 700%. You're kidding yourself. You're still near record low. So this is why we be careful with percentages, right? We want to look at the total data because 
we have a lot more people, 342 million Americans, right? 158 million plus working. It's a different ball game, right? Vacancy, homeownership vacancy rate, or homeowners vacancy rate, it's like near 70 year lows, right? So I'm trying to like, you know, try to explain it in that light. So we, we talked about this. So this is what we talked about last Friday after that article came out on, you know, should we, should we be worried about, um, about this stat? And um, then it, it aired on Monday. And then that's what CNBC wanted to talk to you about. And you talked about that, but you also brought up the inventory story because you felt like they were kind of missing the point. Here, here's the thing. The growth rate of inventory positive and the negative of inventory is when you see severe stress, right? And uh, and one of the things I, I try to show, and, and thankfully, Becky Quick from CNBC got the chart back up again. The price cut percentages are growing as they always do seasonal. It's a very seasonal day line. The slope of the curve right now, I would say it's in between 2023 and 2022. The slope of the curve in 2022 was crazy, right? That was, you know, that came with the biggest home sale crash. And even Becky Quick saw that and said, oh, wow, that is, yeah, that was home sales falling from six and a half million down to four million, even though inventory was low, even though new listings data was low. Boy, the product that we had in there definitely needed some price cuts, especially in the second half to get those homes sold. Now it's not the case. The slope of the curve is rising. Price growth is cooling. We have some hotter price data early in the year in the second half that should cool down. It's a normal marketplace, right? And in this light, this is why this is a healthier housing market than what it was last year. Because I want more choices. People get to uh, list their homes, sell, buy. We need a country to move. We can't be at I don't want to be year six of the lowest home sales ever, right? You know, we need to get things moving because people have to move for jobs and raise families and all this stuff. So uh, what I'm seeing this year is good, but you don't have to like be panicky about the price cut percentages. The growth rate of pricing slowing down is a positive, right? Uh, uh, what happened last year, not, not, not so much. Home sales were near record lows. Housing gets more expensive, right? That means you're going to need lower rates to get even more demand and we want an equilibrium balance and and hopefully this stays the course and i think with rates elevated here you you can still get that the question is what happens if hypothetical rates come down to six percent and it stays down there i feel much better now this year than i did last year because now we have a little bit of a buffer and this is why my whole i'll be completely happy with 2019 inventory levels because we have a buffer now uh, um, uh, if, if demand does pick up and inventory does go down. Another thing to note about the uh, price cut percentage is that it's normal every year for about a third of the homes to get, you know, to have to come down from that uh, listing price in order to sell. And that just makes sense, right? I mean, as you've noted, sellers are greedy. They want to get as much as they can. Sometimes it's not in line. So if we're talking about price cut percentage changes, I mean, we're really talking from the difference between 30%, like sometimes it goes down to 29 or 28. Sometimes it goes up to 33%. But we're not talking about like 60% of the homes are taking a price cut and and this is about to for you know foretell a crash. Well, one third of all homes always have a price cut year round. Uh, and I, I've noticed that when I tour the country, nobody knows that. So in that context with our data, we want to show slopes of the curve and what happens when inventory rises and demand gets weaker, you see more price cuts. That's what we're seeing right now. Now, the data that everyone's working off of is very old, right? Existing home sales, case shiller, all that, all that stuff is old. We're, we're looking now and looking forward. So we're getting more supply and the price cut, the slope is just only moving up. It's nothing dramatic right now. Uh, and that's perfectly healthy and fine. And what we kind of want to see, what we don't want to see is record low levels of sales and strong home price growth. Like that, that does nobody any good. Um, so it, it is one third always gets price cuts and then we move it off that. This is why we want to teach supply and demand equilibrium to get everyone on page of active inventory, new listings, data, price cut percentages, what's going on with the economy. We want to get every, everything involved in housing. So everyone can kind of understand this. And really, I mean, I mean, part of this reason is credit, right? We got the, uh, quarterly fed credit reports. These are the favorite charts. These are the charts that I sit there and go. Oh, it's time to get the cognac out. It's eight o'clock at night. It's got some jazz music going. Here it is, the FICO score data, right? Or, you know, this is going to be on my tombstone. You know, people were fine for foreclosures in 2005, six, seven, and eight. So now that we have it, what we do see in the data line is there is stress in the credit markets now, right? 
it's lower income households and younger lower income households and kind of renters. Uh, uh, and that, I've always said that the Fed talks about, well, we want to help lower income households because of inflation. Now you can see what's happened is that with interest rates up so much and the cost, they're starting to build up uh, a bigger amounts of credit card debt and delinquencies and auto loan delinquencies. And this really comes from lower lower age groups or with uh, lower incomes. That's not a positive. That does not necessary filter to the housing data, right? Remember, homeowners themselves. That's why we use that FICO score, score a lot. A lot of people keep on telling me, like, oh my God, everyone's broke. Homeowners are broke. Inflation, everything. I said, homeowners cash flow is like literally the best in decades. What are you talking about? Uh, no, I would say, no, go read the data. Listen, if there was, everyone's FICO score would be dropping like crazy because the utilization rates of credit cards would expand, which they're not. It's in the data. Everyone, nobody wants to read the utilization credit data because it makes all the credit card things go away. But Homeowners are different than renters. So we see stress in the renter data uh, out there. We see stress in lower income households with auto loans. Homeowners, a different project. And this is the difference between 2008 to 2012. Here we go. New listings data, 250,000 to 400,000 K per week. Here, 30 to 90,000. So you don't have that seller, that stressed seller, that the buildup of all the credit back from 2005, six, seven, eight was happening. And we saw that data in the credit data and it, and it still looks fine. When a job loss recession happens, then those variables change, right? You have more people losing jobs. Jobs not being created means the economic demand is not warranted. That's a different uh, conversation altogether. We're not there yet. Once we get there, once jobless claims break, we will talk about that and then teach people how to read uh, uh, housing data in a recessionary environment. Not there just yet. This is why we don't see stressed sellers or the Airbnb crash, or whatever you know people were making up the last four years. You think about 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, and 2024. Like take 2020 out of the equation because of COVID. New listings data has been trending at the lowest levels ever recorded in history. And it's like May 15th, 2024, right? We've had enough years with enough things thrown at it. I didn't flinch for a reason, guys. All of you guys, some not all of you, but some of you did, right? Because you live in fear. And because you never read the data, you just assume that everybody is this over leveraged person. And, and it just isn't the case. We'll see that in the data and we'll see it stressed into our new listings. But if you take all the credit data from the New York Fed report and then you look at new inventory, new listings data, boy, it makes a lot of sense now, right? Homeowners are really good. So they should be um, uh, handling that process well. So a couple of things I wanted to note for our audience is that, uh, Logan, you talked about the mortgage rate lock-in several times. Mike Simonson, president of Altos Research, wrote a, a report for us that is available um, on our site. And then he and I are going to be talking about that on Friday. So that would be tomorrow by the time this comes out. So tune into that if you want to do a deep dive. He took the FHFA data on mortgage rate lock-in, overlaid the Altos research data came up with eight different insights. Really interesting. Also wanted to mention that we're having our AI summit in July, July 23rd. Don't miss it. We are uh, we are rapidly running out of all sorts of things there because um, it's going to be an amazing event. We've already had a bunch of people sign up. So uh, just two things to note. Logan, thank you so much for being on. We will talk again soon. Thank you so much, Sarah. It was wonderful. Wonderful.